In our last installment, we spent as much time talking about the production of The Fox and the Hound as we did about its main villain. The movie, which was meant to be a groundbreaking piece of work, uniting the retiring animator pros with a new class of talent, ended up getting massively toned down early on. Their next movie, though, was going to be an animated epic. The Black Cauldron. Unfortunately, if you know your Disney history, you're well aware that the movie's production lasted longer than intended, ran into several story problems, and was massively cut and re-edited at the last moment. Even without the edits, I have a feeling that we'd still have a flawed movie on our hands. I detailed a lot of this in a previous video, but in short, the story ultimately leaves the viewers feeling rather cold and unsatisfied. Despite those flaws, I really like this movie. I appreciate them trying something different, even if the experiment did not pay off at all. If there's one thing that sticks out in this jumbled adventure, it's the main villain, the Horned King. Alongside Chernobog and Maleficent, he might be one of the most unapologetically evil, twisted villains in the Disney canon. And yet, memorable as he is, he still feels flawed and a bit half-baked, like the rest of the movie. Take hold of your magic sword, because we're venturing into the dark, crumbling castle. Disney's Black Cauldron is based on the Chronicles of Perdane by Lloyd Alexander. Specifically, it's based on the first two of the five books, The Book of Three and The Black Cauldron. The series was inspired by Welsh mythology and follows the adventures of a boy named Taran who aspires to be a hero. Taran lives in Perdane, based on Wales, and goes on a number of adventures and quests. The overarching villain of the book is Aran Deathlord, the ruler of Anuvan, the land of the dead. As the series progresses, Taran grows from an impulsive youth into a brave, wise hero. He gains many companions in his travels, but many foes as well. Quite a few of these villains were loosely adapted into the Disney movie. We have a lot of characters to cover this time around. I'll be going over all of them, and covering not only their book counterparts, but also the Welsh legends that inspired them. But first, we need to talk a little bit about the lengthy, confusing, frustrating production of the Black Cauldron movie. Quite frankly, you could make an entire documentary on the making of the Black Cauldron. I have a feeling Disney will never do such a thing, as interesting as that may be. The Sweatbox, a documentary covering the making of Kingdom of the Sun, which was heavily reworked into The Emperor's New Groove, was largely suppressed by Disney. That movie had its own production woes, although I think the finished film holds up better than The Black Cauldron. Probably the best account of the behind-the-scenes struggles can be found on YouTube, courtesy of Yesterworld Entertainment. If you haven't watched his video already, I highly recommend seeking it out. To sum things up briefly, the movie's release date kept getting pushed back. Things kept getting retooled. Everyone went into the production with hopes of doing something grand and epic, but the difficulties of making The Fox and the Hound really put things in perspective for the crew. If they couldn't do a relatively simple story set on a farm and nature preserve with the proper emotional depth, what chances did they have on a sweeping dark fantasy? Even after the animation was finally completed, there were still many hurdles. CEO Jeffrey Katzenberg cut a good deal of footage in the editing room. Allegedly, between 10 and 15 minutes of animation got wasted. That's not exactly cheap. Some deleted scenes remain a mystery, but Yesterworld's video sheds a good deal of light on what's missing. Frustratingly, the Horn King's grand entrance to his throne room became his second scene. A scene meant to go much later in the movie, between the visit to the Fair Folk and the Morva sequence, was spliced into the first 10 minutes. This really robs the villain of his proper introduction, and the first time we're supposed to see his horrifying face up close lacks the same impact. Despite the movie's issues and production difficulties, I'm really excited to talk about the villains. There are plenty of bad guys to choose from. Evil overlords, henchmen, dragons, witches. We're going to be here for a while, and lucky us, we have some very bad company. Explaining the Horned King is not quite as arduous a task as working on the Black Cauldron, but it will take a bit of time. To properly talk about our main villain, we need to talk about the book's main villain, Aron Deathlord. The character is based on the King of the Dead in Welsh mythology. Death is a great mystery. Every one of us will eventually know the answer, but will never be able to tell anyone in this earthly realm. So of course, the God of Death is a somewhat mysterious figure, and one to be taken seriously. Based on what I've read, in spite of being associated with something many people dread, Aran was often depicted as a fairly benevolent figure. Even Lloyd Alexander admits in his introduction that he made his version considerably more villainous. Some of the direct inspiration for Alexander's version came from the medieval Welsh poem The Battle of the Trees. Aran is mentioned as being the King of Hell, 
which is certainly a darker title than King of the Dead. The poem also mentions a different man in battle who could only be defeated if you knew his name. In the Chronicles of Perdain, Aran is ruthless in his attempts to conquer the land. He's stolen many treasures which he hoards for himself. One of his most fearsome prizes is the legendary Black Cauldron. This device can animate the dead into unstoppable warriors who know nothing except killing and adding to their numbers. In the Book of Three, we meet Aran's champion, the Horned King. He gets his title from the helmet he wears, which sports an enormous pair of antlers. Deadly on the battlefield, he is also described as having his hands stained with crimson. The character is incredibly mysterious. He never gets any lines of dialogue, and, taking inspiration from the Battle of the Trees poem, he's defeated when one of the heroes calls out his true name. We never find out what the name was, but we're told it wasn't pretty. The Horned King plays a relatively minor role in the series, but Disney decided to make him the main villain. Supposedly, him having horns was a big factor in this. I've seen people saying that Aran was meant to be the main villain at some point in production, but I can't find an actual citation. Even the concept art people have claimed to depict Aran shows a horned character who is probably the Horned King. The most we get of Aran in the movie is in the prologue. He is not named, but described as an evil king who was melted alive, becoming the Cauldron himself. Aran's spirit lives on, giving the Cauldron its evil powers. I can understand why some people wonder if the Disney Horned King was going to be Aran at some point. The character resembles him a bit more than the Horned King from the books, although that's not saying much. Speaking of the books, some of Mel Shaw's early concept art shows the Horned King meeting the same demise he did originally, bursting into flames when his real name is uttered. A different early idea was to make the character a broader, comical Viking warlord with a horned helmet. Later concept art shows him as some sort of beast man, with the horns actually connected to his head. Eventually, they settled on the cloaked skeletal figure. Even then, there were some alterations made along the way. One idea was to have his face entirely engulfed in darkness, seen here in some early test animation by Andreas Deja. This was a theatrical take on the character with grand gestures. Some storyboards show him as being much more open with his emotions and mood swings. In one alternate version of the scene where he meets Taran, the king tries several tactics to get the pig keeper to share his secrets. He speaks kindly to Taran first, then threatens to kill Henwin. When Taran shakily refuses to make her show the location of the cauldron, the king reacts with anger before collecting himself and commending Taran's bravery. Although we don't see what comes next, we do see the king signaling to an early version of Creeper to grab a pair of hot pokers. Whatever Taran's in for, we know it's nothing good. This version of the character has shades of the next big villain, Radigan, who was also an emotional powder keg. The final Horned King was more reserved in his movements, as if he couldn't handle too much activity at once. This is a character that sticks with you long after watching the movie. The sight of this hideous, horned, skeletal figure glaring out from his cloak, coupled with the raspy voice of John Hurt, is certainly distinct. Beyond his appearance and his voice, the King is remembered for being one of the darkest Disney villains, with the brutal intentions to slay anyone and everyone in an attempt to be worshipped as a god. That's as dark as it gets. To add to this, the Horned King is the most mirthless Disney villain I think we've ever seen. Maleficent and Chernabog are incredibly evil, but even they have moments where they crack a smile, even if it's not in the best context. Chernabog loves the demonic revelry on Bald Mountain, and Maleficent gets sadistic enjoyment from tormenting others. But the Horned King, even in the moment of his assumed triumph, never seems to find any joy, even an evil kind of joy, in what he's doing. This ultimately brings up the question of what the Horned King actually is. The character in the book was shrouded in even more mystery, but the movie character is still quite nebulous. Unlike the book, the horns are actually part of his head, and not a helmet. He's essentially a walking, horned corpse with eyes that glow red at intense moments. We don't know his name or his background. Even his wonderfully designed crumbling castle isn't his own. He stole it some time ago and doesn't even know all its secrets. That's how Taran was able to find the magic sword hidden in secret tunnels. This is based on the spiral castle from the book, which was stolen by Arkin, a different villain. The Horned King appears to be a lich of some kind, an undead sorcerer who's given up his humanity to gain magical powers. It's rare to see him show any real emotion, outside of moments of fury. When his cauldron born begin to drop off moments after they've been brought to life, he does show a very brief sign of disappointment, but it's easy to miss. 
any decency he had, if it ever existed in the first place, is long gone. That brings us to the issues with the Horned King as a character. For one, his powers are unspecified. Not that the movie needs to spell everything out, but it would be nice to have an idea of what the villain is capable of. When he enters the Grand Hall, he sucks all the merriment out. A cold wind blows through the room, and electricity sparks everywhere. It makes for a great entrance, but these elemental powers never appear again, even when they might have been useful. His supernatural aura is really only implied. Speaking of what's only implied, the Horned King doesn't actually do much in the movie. Yes, his plan to wipe out humanity is horrifying. His henchmen are many, and he looks like a walking nightmare, but he doesn't really play an active role in most of the story. We are told he's been looking for the cauldron, and we see a blurry vision of him searching, using animation from Fantasia, but that's about it. Most of the time, we just see him shuffling around, sitting on his throne, and strangling Creeper. There's a deleted scene meant to be shown after the prologue where we actually see the Horned King riding his horse through a burning village. There are several pieces of concept art out there for the Horned King on horseback, which I wish they'd kept. Just something to show he was willing to get his hands dirty even before he had the cauldron would have helped. Otherwise, he counts on his henchmen to do everything for him. They're all terrified of him, and go completely silent when he enters the room, but we never see what he's done to earn that kind of reverence. We only see his cruelty to Creeper firsthand, and he's an easy target. The King also doesn't have much of a relationship with the heroes. This does make sense. Terran is an assistant pig keeper on a little farm, and the Horned King is... well, the Horned King. Of course he doesn't know who Terran is at first. But by the end of the story, even when the King tries to kill Terran directly, you don't really feel anything between them. My go-to comparison is Aladdin and Jafar. Aladdin, like Terran, is essentially a nobody to someone powerful like Jafar. He only seeks the boy when he finds out he can use him to get the magic lamp. Even though, in the first movie, Aladdin and Jafar only know each other for the span of about four or five days, they truly hate each other by the end. The final battle feels incredibly personal. None of that really comes through with Terran and the Horned King. Their ultimate showdown feels a bit lacking as well. Even though part of the story is about Terran accepting that he's not the world's greatest hero, at least not in the traditional sense that he wanted, it would have been nice if he got to fight the Horned King a little bit more. Really, he just kicks the Horned King once, and then holds on for dear life as the villain gets sucked into the cauldron. What we missed in a battle scene, we get more than enough when it comes to the Horned King's demise. His death may be one of the most gruesome ones in the entire Disney canon. There is a particularly graphic deleted shot with one of his henchmen that we'll discuss later, but the Horned King's fate is just as morbid. Not only does he get forcibly dragged into the cauldron, but when he holds on to the edges, his skin actually gets ripped off. He wasn't exactly pretty before, but his death is the moldy cherry on top of his hideous life. Even though the execution of his character has plenty of flaws, much like the movie itself, there's a reason why people remember the Horned King with a fond shudder. Next up is the Horned King's main henchman, Creeper, voiced by Phil Fondacaro. All the other main characters are based on someone from the books, but Creeper was created by Disney. He is one of many in the grand tradition of poor, put-upon villain sidekicks. Creeper is certainly not the most competent, but whenever anything goes wrong, whether he's to blame or not, he receives the punishment. It's true that Disney took many liberties with the Bredane characters, but perhaps because Creeper is entirely original, his design went through some of the most changes. The seemingly earliest ideas show him as most human-like. He's a wild-haired little hunchback, somewhere between Igor and Quasimodo. Even though he's closer to a human than he ended up, these hunchback drawings still emphasize his bestial nature. Igor Creeper is often seen drooling, crawling around, and holding an enormous bone. His skin is also an unhealthy shade of pale green. Once it was decided that Creeper should be a creature, they went through several other ideas. One design strongly resembles a gremlin, one is ape-like, and another is pig-like. Our final creeper is a goblin of sorts, although his actual species is never specified. His name isn't really specified either. He's called Creeper by the other henchmen, but it's not clear if that's really his name or just an insult. From his first scene alone, we can deduce that Creeper is very low on the social pecking order among the other henchmen. None of them seem to like him as he gets kicked and thrown around. Creeper's only point of pride is that he acts as the Horn King's closest aid, for what it's worth. Although one could assume there are some privileges that come with that role, we mostly see its disadvantages. The Horned King is even more abusive toward Creeper than his underlings are. His favorite punishment is strangling the creature whenever something goes wrong. Poor Creeper is often reduced to the role of a stress ball. 
The king would probably prefer Creeper anyway. Stress balls don't gasp in pain. The funniest and saddest moment comes from when Creeper offers to strangle himself, and he doesn't appear to be holding back either. Allow me. We'll see a similar treatment with LeFou when we get to Beauty and the Beast. He takes pride in being close to the head honcho, but it winds up making him miserable. He still doesn't get any respect from the larger cohorts, and Gaston smacks him around the most. He wants respect, but his tactics have gotten him even less than he would have received otherwise. Although pitiful, Creeper is by no means an angel. When he does get a rare chance to have power over anyone, he takes full advantage and becomes a little bully. He would probably not be a good person if left to his own devices, but we see him take so much abuse, it's hard not to feel sorry for him anyway. Creeper arrogantly assumes that because he's the main sidekick, he'll be spared in the Horned King's reign of terror. While all the other huntsmen flee in terror from the Cauldron Born, Creeper loyally stays by his master's side, congratulating him on his victory. The moment, of course, does not last. When the undead warriors begin to keel over, the Horned King blames Creeper and decides to throw him into the Cauldron as well. The little goblin is undoubtedly rethinking his life choices at this point. After all the abuse he's taken, it appears the directors finally took pity on Creeper. He manages to survive the destruction of the castle, and is last seen flying off into the clouds. He's more thankful than anyone, even the heroes, that the Horned King has perished, and even mocks his fallen master with his own horns. It's a mystery what life has in store for Creeper, but it's weirdly touching to watch him celebrate a rare little victory. While Creeper is the most notable sidekick, the Horned King has plenty of other servants. The Gwythans leave the biggest impression. These creatures were large birds in the books, serving Aran. To emphasize the grasp Aran had over Prydain, he's actually enslaved an entire species. Birds of prey are plenty threatening, but it seems Disney wanted to take a grander approach. Some concept art shows them depicted as enormous vulture-like creatures. Animator Tim Burton, before he became the big-name director, had a fun, surreal design, envisioning them as bat-like things with heads that resembled human hands. This was rejected for being too much like something out of the Yellow Submarine. Apparently, that was a bad thing. As interesting as the Burton artwork is, like the rest of what he conceived for Cauldron, it simply didn't gel with anything else in the movie. Finally, the Gwythans became a pair of dragons, which are always cool. In the books, the creatures acted as Aran's spies. Few parts of Prydain were safe from their gaze. The dragon Gwythans do act as spies at one point, secretly following Terran and his friends to Morva to locate the Cauldron. Generally, they seem to act more as muscle, kidnapping Henwyn, and later pursuing Terran when he first tries to escape. Tragically for dragon lovers, one of them perishes when the castle is destroyed. The other one escapes with a very thankful creeper on his back. The most numerous of the Horn King's forces are human warriors. His castle is full of brutes from all over the land, all of them ready to carry out their master's dirty work. Their voices are provided by Phil Fondacaro, who also voiced Creeper, Peter Renaday, James Almanzar, Wayne Allwine, Stephen Hale, Jack Lang, and Phil Niblink. Mr. Niblink is the only voice who I can pinpoint to an actual character. He was also an animator for the movie, and voiced a henchman modeled after himself. This is why his character is a bit smaller than the rest of the warriors. Although the hunters are intimidating, there's not all that much to them beyond being fodder to chase Terran, and then in turn be chased by him when he finds the magic sword. The Horned King doesn't really have that much use for them in the long run. Presumably, they've been out slaughtering innocents and collecting their bodies for the cauldron, all according to the King's plans. They fail to realize that once the corpses are animated, they'll no longer be of use to their leader. It's only after a few of them are pounced on by the cauldron born that the rest of the guards realize they're totally expendable. Wisely, they escape while they still can. The most notable of the human henchmen is also the most mysterious. In one scene, we see Fluter being tied up by a particularly stupid-looking minion. An early trailer from the movie actually singled him out as one of the many threats Terran would face. But look what our heroes are up against. Moose. Hmm. Creeper. A servant of evil. And evil is their leader, the Horned King. Moose is presumably the name he had on his model sheet or in the production notes, but his only purpose is to serve as a punchline when Fluter tries to flatter him by calling him intelligent. Some poster concept art even shows Moose as one of the main henchmen being fought off by Terran. Was one of the casualties of Katzenberg's tampering the loss of more Moose material? Probably not. Moose is just one of the many oddities I love to cover in these videos. We hardly knew you, big guy. 
One other character worth mentioning is the poor man hauling the dead warriors around on a cart. We see him a couple of times, wordlessly slaving away. He's the only soldier who Creeper seems to have any direct authority over, and the goblin shows him no mercy. Hopefully he made it out of the castle alive. Whatever they were paying him, it wasn't enough. The guards are aided by a number of dogs, all as ferocious as their owners. One of the model sheets for the dogs is labeled a mean dog named Bernie. Based on the slightly uncommon spelling of the name, I believe this dog was named after one of the story men, Bernie Mattinson. Mattinson actually passed away earlier this year, 2023, and had one of the longest individual careers of the company, starting all the way back in 1953 with Lady and the Tramp. I wonder if any other incidental characters were secretly named after him. Finally, there's a voluptuous dancing woman briefly seen with the henchman. After all, you gotta entertain the troops. Concept art exists for a monster henchman, apparently a hunter of sorts. Other art suggests there may have been an entire race of these sorts of creatures. Perhaps they're the same species as Creeper? We may never know. The most dangerous of the Horned King's underlings are only seen briefly. The Cauldron Born, created by the Cauldron itself. Before the Chronicles of Bredain, the story of a special cauldron with magical powers had been recorded in various folklore. One with resurrection powers was the focus of the story, Bronwyn, Daughter of Lear. Lloyd Alexander's stories give this already eerie idea an even more sinister angle. The warriors brought back to life are mindless zombies who exist only to kill and increase their rank. The only way to stop the cauldron's power is through sacrifice. One must willingly climb in, knowing they will never climb out alive. In the Disney movie, this also destroys the Cauldron Born. The books make it harder. It destroys the Cauldron, but the existing Cauldron Born remain active. With the Cauldron destroyed, one just can't make any more of them. No good can come from the Black Cauldron. A good deal of the Horned King's reign of terror seems to be based around him slaughtering and gathering more and more corpses to fulfill their dark purpose. The quest for the Cauldron consumes him, since his body count won't truly matter unless he has something to actually do with the bodies. By the time the cauldron is finally in his possession, he has an entire chamber full of skeletons ready to become his undead warriors. All it takes is a single body thrown into the cauldron to start the hideous process of creating Cauldronborn. Just like in the book, the only thing these creatures can do is kill. There's an idea to have special holographic versions of the soldiers appear to march out of the screen and into the audience, but the idea was too technologically advanced to actually pull off. An added detail is how the skeletons are brought to life. An acidic green smoke rises from the cauldron and seeps into the bodies. While it gives the skeletons life, it's toxic to the living. Gurgi seems to know to avoid touching it, and an infamous deleted scene would have directly shown its effects on a human. The moment when the cauldron born pounced on a few of the huntsmen was originally longer. A truly gruesome shot would have shown one of them getting completely dissolved by the smoke. I'd love to see the fully animated version, but I'm also kind of relieved it never made it into the final cut. What's more, the mist is shown seeping out of the castle and into the woods beyond. It's quite possible it could have brought more bodies to life or dissolved the innocent people of Perdane. Luckily for everyone, the cauldron born never make it past the drawbridge, and the mist is pulled back into the cauldron. One small thing to point out. When the cauldron begins its life-giving process, its clawed feet appear to clamp down on the ground, implying it may have been alive itself. Best not to dwell on that too much, since it's certainly out of commission now. Our final villain group is not associated with the Horned King, but they do have a connection to the Black Cauldron. They own it. We're making a stop in the marshes of Morva to discuss a trio of tricky witches. For these characters, Lloyd Alexander drew inspiration from another classic myth archetype. We can see it in the Scandinavian Norns or the Greek Fates, three mysterious women who weave the tapestry of everyone's destiny. One of the proposed openings for the Disney movie even showed the witches at work on their tapestry illustrating a great battle, and remarking on the soldiers who lost their lives. The Perdane Witches are not villains in the book, although they are not to be trifled with. They initially intend to turn our heroes into toads in order to protect their hiding place. They assure Terran that he'll be quite happy in his new form, and try to be as friendly as one can be about the whole thing. Even after Terran befriends the Witches, we get the feeling that he's never all that safe around them. It's not that they're evil, they're just very... different from the average mortal. The main one to fear is Orgotch, who's always hungry for a human snack and doesn't try to hide it. Orwin is the bubbly friendly one, and Ordu is the leader. They apparently take turns playing the role of each witch, rotating on an undefined schedule. 
The Ordu you're talking to one day might be Orin the next. None of them like being Orgotch. The Black Cauldron was originally theirs, before they lent it to Aran. When he didn't return it on time, they simply stole it right back. They also informed Terran and friends that its proper name is the Black Crokin. Although they're initially off-putting, the witches are actually quite helpful to Terran throughout the series. He just doesn't always realize he's being helped in the moment. Sometimes that's how life is. We don't have the advantage of seeing the full tapestry before us whenever we want. The Disney witches have less layers than the ones in the book, and are much less kind-hearted. I'm pretty comfortable listing them as villains in this video. Instead of helping Taryn in a mysterious trickster sort of way, they actively try to rip him off. We'll trade the cauldron for the sword. But what can they do with the cauldron, Ordu? Nothing! We'll end up with both! True, they make a similar trade in the book, but they were happy to get rid of the cauldron. There was never an intention to take it back from Taran, whether he was able to use it or not. In the movie, even after the evil within it is destroyed, the witches are very quick to swoop down and try to retrieve it. What's more, they had to be goaded into making a second trade, rather than just stealing it back. Outside of cauldron-related affairs, they also intend to eat all the people they turn into frogs and toads, instead of just letting them free afterward. One thing that does remain consistent with the original story is that their motivations are never quite clear. Why does Ordu want Terran's sword? An assistant pig keeper might not need a magic sword, but an already powerful witch probably doesn't have much reason either. Also, in addition to the Black Cauldron, the witches have an enormous assortment of other cauldrons just lying around. I suppose one has to expect such eccentricities from swamp-dwelling hermits, witches or otherwise. Their personalities, while somewhat based on the books, have been exaggerated a bit. While they've lost a lot of their nuance, they're wildly entertaining characters. Ordu, voiced by Ida Rees Marin, is still the leader. She's charming when she wants to be, especially when it comes to making bargains. She can't resist a good trade, usually one that benefits her more than the other party. Orgotch is even more aggressive about getting a meal out of her visitors, to the point that she resembles a Looney Tunes predator. Her voice actress, Billy Hayes, previously played Witchy Poo on the HR Puffin Stuff series, and is essentially doing the same routine. It's not exactly a deep performance, but there's a lot of wonderful energy. Orwin, voiced by Adele Malice Mori, appears to be the youngest of the witches. Her bubbly personality from the books has given way to a flirtatious one. For whatever reason, she falls head over heels for Fluter, and is already talking about marriage seconds after meeting him. The bard does not feel the same way, but it doesn't seem to matter to her all that much. Although she's about as trustworthy as the others, meaning not much, Orwin is the one to offer Terran the hero's sword at the end. Even though he ultimately declines the treasure, she can at least see that he earned it. More credit where it's due, the witches also bring Gurgi back to life. True, they only do it when Fluter calls their powers into doubt, but it's something. Thankfully, this doesn't appear to be a pet cemetery situation, and Gurgi is his old, greedy, lovable self. I can definitely see some shades of Ursula in the witches' characterization. We have the design and flirtiness of Orwin, the hunger of Orgotch, and the slick charms of Ordu. They have a small role in the movie, but the characters really were signs of great films to come. I wouldn't even be surprised if they served as an inspiration for the Sanderson sisters in Hocus Pocus. Because I have no other good place to put it, we'll end our main villain rundown with a look at the music behind Black Cauldron. This is the first Disney animated film to not have any songs with lyrics. Even Fantasia had Ave Maria at the end. Instead, the film boasted a wonderful adventure score by Elmer Bernstein. Bernstein wrote some truly outstanding soundtracks in the 50s and 60s, like The Ten Commandments, The Great Escape, and The Magnificent Seven. He infused that classic Hollywood sound for the Black Cauldron, filling it with rousing anthems and dark, brooding dirges. Character themes abound, and there are three major villain themes throughout the film. The Horned King gets a memorable booming piece that helps him dominate the screen whenever he appears. That is not a theremin, by the way. It's a synthesizer called the Own Martino. Bernstein became enamored with the instrument after scoring Ghostbusters. Most of his later films feature the Marino somewhere, usually played by Cynthia Millar. Creeper has a silly theme that reminds me a bit of a frog slowly bouncing down a path. Given his small green appearance, it feels rather appropriate. There's also a recurring motif that plays whenever the Horned King strangles Creeper.
Finally, the Black Cauldron itself has a theme. Unlike the Horned King's over-the-top music, this piece is slower, bringing the marching Cauldronborn to mind. In general, the Disney Company tends to favor certain movies over others. You'll see some characters and stories continuously revisited, while others are relegated to obscurity. Given the difficulties they face with the Black Cauldron's production and initial reception, I can understand why we don't see Prydain all that often. The Horn King made a cameo on the House of Mouse, but it was the Cauldron and its Cauldronborn that had a major appearance. In House of Magic, Daisy decides on a whim to be a stage magician. Her first act results in her accidentally making the audience disappear. To reverse this, she uses the Black Cauldron, which she found in their cavernous prop warehouse. As you perhaps expected, the Cauldron is only good for summoning Cauldronborn. This isn't quite how it worked in the movie, since here it seems to conjure up the skeletons from within itself. Either way, Daisy tries to make them disappear, but makes the entire nightclub vanish instead. Even after everything's put back in order, Daisy tries to use the cauldron to make fondue. This is Daisy we're talking about, after all. That leads to, of course, more cauldronborn. I just talked about this in a recent entry, but the cauldron was heavily featured in the DVD movie Once Upon a Halloween. Or, rather, it was one of its cauldron brethren. To recap, the evil queen from Snow White is trying to take over the world, or something, on Halloween, it's really just a vague setup for a clip show, and wants to summon a powerful villain to help her. Her companion for the movie is a large cauldron voiced by Cory Burton. He explains that he once belonged to the Witches of Morva, and talks about a different villain who wanted to use the cauldron for evil. This, of course, segues into Clips of the Horned King. I've seen people saying that this cauldron is the Black Cauldron, but it never directly says so. Given that the witches have a huge collection of other cauldrons, I don't see why he couldn't be one of them instead. Creeper got his own chance to shine in The Legend of the Three Caballeros. Well, sort of. There's a character who's clearly modeled after Creeper. I'm guessing he's a descendant of some kind. We get confirmation that Creeper is indeed a goblin, and meet the rest of his species down down in Goblin Town. The goblins are a naturally violent, cruel bunch, but our Creeper lookalike, who everyone calls Worm, is peaceful and friendly. Of course, that means he's an outcast. Little Worm, voiced by Nicholas Roy, helps the Caballeros escape the dreaded Goblin Jail and fight against their main enemies, Feldrake and Sheldgoose. These two have hoodwinked the Goblins into putting them in charge, but the real goal is to steal their war machine. For his help in saving Goblin Town, Worm gets the respect he deserves. He is made King of the Goblins, and at long last is called by his true, respectable name, Vomit. The Horned King only made one further appearance in comic form. This was a sequel, Choose Your Own Adventure Story, that I've done my best to translate. It was a little difficult, since all the panels are out of order, depending on which route the reader takes. Ilanwi has been kidnapped by the Horned King, so Taryn, Fluter, Gurgi, and Henwin set off to rescue her. Along the way, they run into the Witches and Creeper. The Witches sell Taryn the sword, and also offer some advice about which direction to take. Readers should take the sword, but ignore their advice. They're lying, and listening to them will get Terran lost. Creeper is a neutral party this time. He is no longer working for the Horned King, good for him, and will sell Terran his boat in exchange for food. If Terran has no food, he has to fight the little goblin. The entrance to the Horned King's hideout is in a shack in the swamp. It leads to a vast underground fortress. Terran finally gets a proper battle with the Horned King this time, and defeats him by letting some sunlight into the room. I guess vampire rules apply in this case. Just some more deep-cut lore for you. Often, when a new Disney movie comes out that the company has high hopes for, a theme park attraction is developed. And as Imagineers will tell you, it's also quite often that the movie doesn't do as well as expected, so the plans are shelved. The Black Cauldron is one of the many movies that never made the transition to a grand e-ticket ride. I found one piece of concept art showing a dark ride on a boat through the Horn King's castle. I also heard a rumor about an idea for a dark ride that could take different branching paths, but I can't back that one up. Even though the Black Cauldron never received an attraction to itself, the Horned King played a very important role in a haunted walkthrough at Tokyo Disneyland. In my earlier videos, I would often discuss the Villain's Revenge video game, and it was sort of sad when I reached Captain Hook, because that was the last time I'd be able to revisit the subject. I feel the same way about the late, great Cinderella Castle Mystery Tour. I'll give one last recap. Guests would start a tour of the castle, but would quickly be hijacked by the Magic Mirror, who wanted to highlight Disney's rogues gallery. Instead of charming fairy tale sweets, 
guests will explore the dark, secret underbelly of Magic Kingdom, encountering alchemy labs, goblins, ghoulies, and a fearsome dragon. The grand finale featured the Horned King and his Cauldronborn. The movie had just come out, and presumably the attraction was being developed around the theatrical release. Had it been made a year or two later, I'm not sure if the ending would have been the same. Nevertheless, guests find themselves standing before the Horned King, the Cauldron, and a sea of skeletons. The animatronic king informs them that they'll be thrown into the cauldron themselves and join his undead army. A child from the crowd is selected to aim the Sword of Light at the king and defeat him. Even in the darkest dungeons, good always triumphs over evil. The mystery tour was a thing of beauty. Maybe not in the traditional sense, but the idea that something so dark and spooky could exist under Cinderella Castle of all places was brilliant. Of course, that means it was simply too good to last. Now the walkthrough is based strictly on the story of Cinderella herself, and is exactly the kind of sweet, pretty tour guests would have taken before the Magic Mirror corrupted it. This isn't an opinion I usually have, but sometimes there's something to be said for a little corruption. The Horned King made no walk-around appearances, which makes sense given how scary he is. There was a Creeper costume, but he was a rare sight. Unless anyone has any memories of meeting Creeper, I feel he was mostly used for promotional means. I found a few pictures, some footage of him in a show at Tokyo, and a very odd French music video. Dushka Esposito is a French musical artist who worked closely with the Disney company in the 80s. One of her songs, Tara Mais le Chaldron Magique, was made to promote the Black Cauldron. The music video features her dancing with Taran and not one, but two Gurgis. Creeper is seen slinking around at a few points, giving us possibly the best view of his costume. Shortly after the movie's original release, Sierra put out a Black Cauldron computer game. It was a classic point-and-click adventure game following the main story. Players control Taran, of course, off on the same quest to protect Henwyn and destroy the Black Cauldron before the Horned King can use it. The Horned King, Creeper, the Gwythants, and the Witches all make appearances. A single henchman appears to roam the lonely castle, grabbing Taran if he's not careful. It's actually unclear if this was meant to be the same henchman each time. If it is, He's awfully fast, and I haven't seen multiple henchmen appear at once. Is that you, Moose? What's interesting about this game is that the players can choose different paths and actually get a better ending than the movie. If they do everything correctly, they can first drop Henwin off at a safe place with Gwistel. Gwistel was one of the fair folk in the books. Although there is some concept art of the character for the movie, he didn't make it into the final script. I was pleasantly surprised to see that he hasn't been completely forgotten. One of the items Terran can receive is a magic mirror from King Idaleg of the Fair Folk. If Terran shows the Horned King his reflection, the enchantment will show something different. The King will see his inner self, revealing an evil so hideous that he flings himself into the cauldron, destroying it. I assume the Horned King already knew how vile he really was, but perhaps seeing a visual representation was simply too much. The witches are a little nicer here, and don't have to be reminded to make a trade for the cauldron. They offer Terran a shield in return. If Terran holds out, they offer him a suit of armor, and if he still holds out, they return the sword he originally traded. Not bad for an assistant pig keeper. Elsewhere, the Horned King actually had a decent run as the main villain in some 90s Mickey Mouse games. Unfortunately, not everyone got to see them due to regional differences. One game I think the most people would be familiar with was The Land of Illusion, made by Sega in 1993. After falling asleep reading fairy tales, Mickey dreams he visits a village where a mysterious phantom has stolen the protective magic crystal. Being the adventurous hero he is, Mickey sets off to recover the treasure from the phantom's castle in the clouds. To no one's surprise, at least no one watching this video, the phantom is really the Horned King. He puts up a decent fight, but Mickey is able to recover the crystal and get the standard platformer reward, a quick kiss from a princess. Prepare yourselves, because we are going down the crazy castle rabbit hole. And I'm not just saying that because of Bugs Bunny. Yes, if you grew up with a Game Boy, there's a decent chance that you've played at least one of the Crazy Castle games. This Chemco series took the players through the titular castles in a series of seemingly never-ending action puzzle stages. Bugs Bunny starred in about half of them, but only in the North American releases. The properties utilized for each game vary from region to region, including other heroes like Woody Woodpecker and Kid Clown. The history of these games is a bit too involved to fully discuss here, so we'll start with the Horned King's first appearance as the villain. 1989's Mickey Mouse 2 was released in Japan and parts of Europe. The plot is as simple as they come. The Horned King has imprisoned Minnie in his castle, his crazy castle if you will, and Mickey needs to rescue her. Underlings encountered within include Pete, Stromboli, and the Wicked Witch. 
The weirdest choices for henchmen were actually in the previous game, which did not feature a final boss, Horned King or otherwise. For some reason, two of the enemies are the March Hare and one of the Jungle Book Vultures. Mickey Mouse 3 Balloon Dreams is counted as a Crazy Castle game, but is more of a traditional platformer. Mickey is informed that Minnie won't wake up. He deduces that she's having an awful nightmare, and he needs to go into her dreams and wake her. That seems like a big leap in logic, but Mickey ends up being correct, so I guess I'm the idiot. Luckily, Mickey has countless balloons to use as weapons. You could chalk this up to dream logic, but he had the same balloons before entering Minnie's dreams. Again, one of the Jungle Book vultures randomly acts as a villain here. As it turns out, Minnie is suffering from five nightmares, represented by five levels. When it appears that all is well, nightmare number six emerges, the Horned King. He is apparently targeting Mickey to prove that kindness and bravery don't actually exist. Mickey, of course, rises to the challenge. Despite the Horned King appearing larger than he ever does anywhere else, Mickey beats him with his balloons. That takes real bravery. And helium. Surprisingly humbled at his defeat, the King admits that he was wrong, and tells Mickey to always love and protect Minnie. Aww. These next two Japan-exclusive games were made by a different programmer, but oddly enough, also feature Mickey using weaponized balloons. In Mickey no Tokyo Disneyland Iboken, Mischievous Pete has scattered all of Mickey's friends around the Magic Kingdom. Mickey needs to find everyone so they can rehearse their big show. Using balloons for weapons and mobility, Mickey explores many of the park's big attractions to find his missing friends. Pete battles him at the end of each level, dressed appropriately for the location. The last level takes place in the Cinderella Castle Mystery Tour. Pete appears at the end, dressed as the Horned King. The Cauldronborn come marching in as well, but it turns out they're just Pete's normal henchmen getting into the act. A sequel came out a few years later, taking place exclusively in the Mystery Tour. I'm not 100% sure on the plot, since it's all in Japanese and was never translated, but it appears that Pluto got spooked early in the tour and ran off. Once again using his balloons, Mickey heads in after him, battling all the ghouls and goblins along the way. The Horned King is of course the final boss, not Pete in a costume this time. He does look a little silly, but that's mostly due to the Game Boy's graphics. It would appear that the Horned King has some cultural relevance in Japan, perhaps a little more than he has over here in the States. Despite this, he has yet to appear in a Kingdom Hearts game. Kingdom Hearts 4 is on the way, so let's see what happens. His most recent video game outing was in the Sorcerer's Arena, where he and the Cauldronborn were just a couple players in the massive cast. If there's one takeaway here, it's that Terran shouldn't be too sad about giving up his sword. If he can learn to harness the awesome powers of balloons, he'll be the ultimate hero. As we close the book on the Horned King, we'll be moving on to our bonus villain. This is very similar to the case we had in my previous entry with the MCP from Tron. Now, Tron was a very different movie from The Fox and the Hound, and I'm well aware that pairing Amos Slade with the MCP was a very weird choice. This time, there's less of a major contrast between our villains. We're moving from the Horned King onto the Gnome King from Return to Oz. I know it's a stereotypical video essay tactic to go a hundred years into the past before you talk about the subject that people are actually here to learn about, but that's what I'm doing. These videos have become just as much about Disney history as they have about the villains. I'll try to keep it brief. Disney has had a knack for adapting stories and making it so people know their versions better than the source material. If I named Snow White, Peter Pan, or Winnie the Pooh, you'd probably picture the Disney versions first and foremost. The big exception is The Wizard of Oz. This time, it's the MGM versions of the characters that come to mind before the originals. L. Frank Baum actually wrote 14 Oz books, but it's ultimately his first one, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, that people know the best. A good deal of this can definitely be attributed to the MGM movie. There have been many other adaptations over the years, and while two of the stage musical versions have found success, The Wiz and Wicked, a lot of other Oz media has remained more of a niche thing. Walt Disney wanted to have his own Oz movie, and began production on The Rainbow Road to Oz in 1954. He went so far as to do a TV special promoting the movie in 1956, but the production was ultimately cancelled when he was unsatisfied with how things were going. There were also ideas to incorporate the Oz characters into the storybook land ride at Disneyland. Eventually, the most Oz thing that Walt himself ended up producing was a few records. Fast forward to 1985. One month before The Black Cauldron premiered, a different dark Disney fantasy hit theaters. Return to Oz is based on the second two Oz books by Baum. The Marvelous Land of Oz, and Ozma of Oz. 
The film was mostly live action, but the main villain and some of his henchmen were wonderfully animated creations. With that bit of history out of the way, we'll take a proper look at our bonus villain, the Gnome King. The Wicked Witch of the West is often regarded as the main villain in the Oz franchise. This is true of many post-bomb productions, thanks to the success of the MGM movie, but in the original book, the Gnome King was the most frequent antagonist. In fact, the Wicked Witch only appeared in the first book, and played a relatively small role. The Gnome King first appeared in Ozma of Oz. That's gnome spelled N-O-M-E, unlike the traditional gnome with the G. These gnomes are described as rock fairies. Their king appears as a jolly Santa Claus-like figure. Underneath the jovial surface, he's as cold as the rocks he rules over. In the story, Ozma, Dorothy, and all the others journey to the Gnome Kingdom to free some prisoners. A different cruel king sold his family to the Gnome King as slaves in exchange for a long life. When he realized what a terrible thing he'd done, the man threw himself off a cliff. The Gnome King argues that this didn't really negate the deal, since the man did it to himself. Still, he offers Ozma a chance to free his slaves. He's transformed them into various trinkets that are scattered around his enormous trophy hall. If Ozma can guess which ones are the prisoners, they can go free. If she can't, she'll be turned into an ornament as well. The King's deal appears legitimate, but the odds are very much stacked against our heroes. Even after they do manage to free the prisoners, he refuses to let them go, showing his true colors. Of course, all turns out well in the end. The Gnome King is defeated, but he returns time and time again to make trouble in future stories. Return to Oz features a secondary villain named Mombi, who is actually a combination of two Oz characters. Her background and main role in the plot is based on Mombi the Witch, who secretly kept Princess Ozma hidden to prevent her from taking the throne as the rightful ruler of Oz. The more memorable aspects given to her character, chiefly the swapping of heads, was based on Princess Languadir. Languadir is not a classically evil villain like Mombi. She's the kind of lazy, entitled, careless evil you're more likely to find in everyday life. Except for the whole head thing. She collects beautiful heads that she can wear and change whenever she wants. And wouldn't you know it, but she takes a fancy to Dorothy's head upon meeting her. I can see why the filmmakers wanted to combine these characters for that angle alone. Finally, we have the Wheelers, a race of strange people with wheels for hands and feet. This makes them utterly harmless, but they try to convince everyone they're dangerous. Some of this is because of self-preservation, but they're also mischief makers at heart and really enjoy scaring others. If you've watched the 1939 Wizard of Oz as a child, and I think most of us probably did, I'm sure you found something in it terrifying. I was scared of the witch. Others were scared by the trees and the flying monkeys. Return to Oz takes an even darker route. How dark? At the beginning, Dorothy appears to be suffering from Oz withdrawal after her return to Kansas, to the point that she can't sleep. Her concerned aunt takes her to Dr. Worley, who proposes a little electroshock therapy to cure her delusions. Yes, the scariest section, at least from an adult perspective, comes very early in the film. Even after escaping and getting whisked back to Oz, Dorothy has many more nightmares to encounter, leading to a fiery climax with the Gnome King. Taking inspiration from the MGM version, Dorothy encounters several people in the real world who appear to be reflected by people she meets in Oz. First, there's Dr. Worley and the Gnome King, both played by Nicole Williamson. Worley is very excited about the turn of the century, and can see just how influential electricity is going to be. He is correct. The problem is how he channels his passion. As I said, he's convinced there's a bright future in electroshock therapy. He's already been proven wrong several times. There is an undisclosed number of damaged patients locked in his basement, and Dorothy could very likely have joined them if Ozma didn't help her escape. Upon her return to Oz, Dorothy finds the Emerald City has been stripped of its emeralds and its citizens turned to stone. Wheelers prowl the streets, and a mysterious Princess Mombi is ruling the rubble in place of the Scarecrow. The culprit is the Gnome King, who has reclaimed the emeralds from the city. They were just dug out of the mountain, but that's stealing in the King's Book. The Scarecrow is an ornament that must be freed from the King's treasure room. Each time one of Dorothy's friends guesses wrong and gets turned into an ornament, the King becomes less of a rock person and more human. How did he get such great power? He found Dorothy's famous slippers. No wonder the Wicked Witch wanted them so badly. They're also, apparently, one size fits all. As a quick note, in the original book, the Gnome King has a magic belt, not the slippers. Although the Gnome King does not share the same love of electricity as Dr. Worley, they do have a lot in common. Both men are not as honest as they claim. Worley appears to be a legitimate doctor, but he keeps using the same unsafe tactics on his patients after hurting so many of them in the past. The King gives Dorothy a very difficult, but ultimately fair chance to save the Scarecrow. 
He could have easily just not put the Scarecrow's ornament in the room, and no one would have found out. He even offers to magically send Dorothy home instead of taking the challenge. But then, when Dorothy does miraculously guess correctly, he tries to kill them anyway. The comfort he offers a distraught Dorothy, the surprisingly tasty-looking rock desserts he gives everyone, that was only when he thought he was winning. A slightly more subtle similarity can be gleaned as well. Worley's ultimate goal with Electroshock is to stop Dorothy from thinking about Oz. Later, when the Gnome King offers to send Dorothy home, he says she'll never think about Oz again. He has the same semi-condescending tone and everything. It's very nicely handled in the script, and shows the writers really took their time planning this all out. The Gnome King's goal of becoming human is never fully explained, but it ultimately doesn't matter. Once his plans are dashed, he becomes an enormous rock monster and tries to eat our brave heroes. As luck would have it, eggs are poisonous to gnomes, and Dorothy's chicken companion drops one right down the king's throat. Ding dong, the king is dead. Back in Kansas, Dr. Worley's hospital is hit by lightning instead of flame. Worley, who's been blindly devoted to electrotherapy regardless of the harm it's caused, refuses to leave without his equipment. In trying to save machines that have hurt so many people, he ends up dying himself. That's another parallel. The Gnome King was not killed by fire, but there were a lot of flames during his rampage. The other major bad guy is Mombi, reflected by Nurse Wilson in Kansas. Dr. Worley's misdeeds cannot be excused, but can at least be explained as a man fully devoted to what he believes in. Nurse Wilson is just a cold, cruel person. She brings Nurse Ratchet to mind, and Louise Fletcher was even considered for the part. The role went to Jean Marsh, who naturally played Mombi as well. Like Languideer from the books, Mombi has a haul of different women's heads to choose from. Two of the alternate heads are played by Sophie Ward and Fiona Victory. Marsh plays the true face of Mombi. Taking a page from the Wicked Witch of the West, Mombi has her own army of creepy henchmen. These are the Wheelers, who were unaffiliated with any villains in the original book. While Bomb's Wheelers are said to be essentially harmless, I'm not sure if the movie ones are. Some of that is purely based on how frightening they are when they first appear, but these ones are working for Mombi, possibly against their will. I doubt she would enslave creatures she didn't have any use for. Freed Wheelers can be seen cheering in the Hero's Victory Parade. The Wheelers wear helmets with terrifying expressions. Knocking them off reveals their punk hairdos, which is one of the only things in the movie that reminds us it was filmed in the 80s. Their leader is played by Pons Marr, who also plays an orderly in the hospital. The carts they push around make the same noise that the Wheelers do. Marr also voices a messenger gnome who reports to his king as Dorothy gets closer. He can apparently shift from rock to rock, so he can always keep an eye on things upstairs. While only seen briefly, he makes some wonderfully expressive faces. They have discovered the yellow brick road, and are on their way to the Emerald City. Good. They won't get past Mombi. A lot of praise should be given to Will Vinton, the claymation animator who oversaw the Gnome King sequences. The animation for the Gnome King and the other gnomes is fantastic, and one of the movie's high points. The very same year, Vinton directed The Adventures of Mark Twain, which had its own infamously terrifying moments. 1985 was a great year for scaring kids, huh? We don't really get visceral scares like that in Disney movies anymore. Was anything truly frightening in Encanto? I mean to the level of stuff we saw in these movies? I miss having some genuine thrills in family films. There's a great documentary on the animation behind the Gnome King on YouTube that I will be sure to link to in the description. Musically, although there are no songs, Return to Oz has a wonderful score by David Shire. Both this score and the one for the Black Cauldron are my favorite kind, the kind you don't see as much anymore, rich, orchestral, and full of great character themes. The villain's music this time is not as melodic as the heroes. The Gnome King and the Wheelers are represented by moods more than melodies that you could easily pinpoint. The Gnome has ominous shifting tones, and the Wheelers have clanging percussion. Mombi's theme is the clearest, since we actually see her playing it on the mandolin a few times. There are not really many further appearances of the Gnome King out there. A video game of Return to Oz came out in 1986, and was a point-and-click game like the Black Cauldron from the same year. Unlike the Black Cauldron, which looked to be of pretty good quality for the time, this game seems much cheaper. The villains are all present, but I can't find much information or a full playthrough. From the little I've gathered, it's not supposed to be very good. The weirdest thing I found was a Spanish children's book adaptation of the movie from 1987. 
Instead of basing the illustrations on the actors from the movie, the artist chose to cast Disney characters in the roles. You can see a red-headed Ailanwi as Dorothy, Alice as Ozma, Lady Tremaine as Nurse Wilson, and King Hubert of all people as the Gnome King. Disney would eventually make another Oz movie in 2013, Oz the Great and Powerful. It has nothing to do with the Gnome King, and the villains featured are all live action, so I won't be covering it. Just to put a little bow on things, this final note does not have to do with any of the villains. Like I said, at one point, Walt wanted Storybook Land's grand finale to feature the Land of Oz. Guests would enter the Big Rock Candy Mountain, like the song, and see scenes of Dorothy's friends celebrating her birthday. This never made it into the park, but the Disneyland Paris version ends on the Emerald City, modeled after the version from Return to Oz. Disney's next movie was The Great Mouse Detective, with a truly fantastic villain, Radigan. But before we cover the world's greatest criminal mind, we're going to look at Disney's early animated TV series. Being cartoons in the mid-80s, the three that we'll be looking at all involve colorful, silly, marketable animals. The Wuzzles, Gummy Bears, and Fluffy Dogs await us. Who are you, they said. The Crack just growled instead and made himself look very big and mean. He said, I am Crack Master. But just then the wall plaster began to crumble to the floor and where the monster stood were only beams of wood. He destroyed himself trying to be mean. <laughs> 